Hello, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, the podcast where I live. Absolute crazy person tells you a story from ancient Greek mythology. I don't know why I'm singing. I'm not very good at it. So, guys, thank you so much to everyone who's been listening. It's been really exciting for me. I would love to hear from you, too, if you're at all inclined. Um... I've been rambling about all the places you can reach me, and I'll do it again at the end of the episode, but just putting it out there, I'd love to hear from anyone. Suggestions, comments, amazing compliments. Do you want to hear a particular myth sometime? Tell me. I got kind of a list, but just sort of going everywhere. On our last full episode, we covered Zeus's many escapades and this week we're gonna delve into the ramifications of one such union also a little bit of extra fun this week's episode will bleed into next week's episode because connected in mythologically crazy ways quick note for anyone who could possibly be as troublingly nerdy as myself this story is really a combination of Greek myths and later interpretations by the Romans. My man Ovid really popularized it, and he was a Roman. So that's all to say, I'm venturing out a bit. The Greek myths were so interconnected with their later Roman interpretations that they generally do tend to blend together more often than not. I mean, even the name Hercules is Roman, it's not Greek. You know, he was Heracles in Greek, but it just, I guess it doesn't have the same ring to it, or Disney didn't pick it. I guess it really would have been Kevin Sorbo even before whoever, guys. Somehow Hercules became Greek, and he's just not. Anyway, nerd disclaimers aside, we're going into one of Zeus's creepy encounters from the last episode, Europa. We're going to cover Europa and what that, let's call it what it is, abduction resulted in. This is episode four. Queen Pasiphae did what with a bull? If you'll recall, Zeus kidnaps the teenage Europa by appearing to her in the form of a beautiful white bull. He tempts her with his animal cuteness and she climbs aboard only to have him leap from the beach and out into the sea where he just starts swimming. Zeus brings Europa to the island of Crete, where he, in effect, installs her as queen in the Cretan city of Knossos. They have a few children, which starts a kind of bull dynasty on the island of Crete. That island, if you don't know, is part of Greece, but it's really far south in the Mediterranean. It's closer to Egypt than it is to Greece. This is just a brag, but I've been there and my god, it's so beautiful and all I want in this world is to go back. Historically, like way, way back, it was kind of a world in itself in ancient Greece. All the little regions that we know from history and mythology were kind of kingdoms in themselves back then anyway. This is before the whole like super crazy air quotes democracy came around. Um, So they were all kingdoms and they all had their own kings, but something about Knossos, which or sorry, Crete, that was so far away from Greece that it was just kind of like a separate place entirely. They, it's actually some of the earliest Greek civilizations were on the island of Crete. They were called the Minoans and they were awesome. They built a number of what archeologists call palaces. And that's because the archeologist that discovered them, he wanted it to be this palace of Knossos, like what we're gonna cover in this story. He wanted it to be Knossos so bad that he kind of convinced himself and everyone else. We found this complex that they created on Crete. The ancient Greeks, they did this and it. there were so many of these. They were massive, these intricate complexes with throne rooms and mosaics and these massive cisterns that held something. So basically this archeologist, he finds this and he says, oh my God, this has to be the palace of Knossos. Like that throne room, that's King Minos' throne room. It's this whole thing. They just kind of place history and myth onto a location. It happened a lot back then of sort of the turn of the century archeologists before there were kind of like rules and ethics, I guess, because the guy who discovered Troy and the same with the guy who discovered Mycenae, two guys for all three of these locations and I never remember who's who but anyway 
when they found Troy, he basically went to Turkey and he found this spot that had these giant walls. And he was like, oh, well, that's Troy. Troy had big walls. And then another guy goes to Mycenae and he finds this mask of this random guy's face. And he's like, oh my God, this is the face of Agamemnon. And this mask to this day is still called the Mask of Agamemnon. And it's almost certainly not Agamemnon because he was probably definitely a myth, but it's just super fun anyway and we have these places that we can call those ancient worlds even if there is little to no archaeological proof that they were associated with the mythology at all like troy was probably troy but the trojan war is pretty debatable anyway this is a mythology podcast live not a nerdy archaeology podcast so i'm gonna calm down the minoans they worshipped females. They painted badass dolphins on their walls. They were all around fascinating. Again, I'm going into history and not mythology, just a little bit more. Eventually, of course, the patriarchy took over. So there isn't much mythological proof of their worship of women, but archaeologically, there's some pretty good evidence and it's pretty cool. All to say, like, this was all happening 2000 BCE, so like 4,000 years ago. It's totally crazy. The Minoans even invented a language that to this day we have been unable to translate. It's called Linear A, and for all we know, they've discovered the key to immortality or they've detailed conversations with aliens and it's all just waiting for us to translate. In all honesty, there's a similar language called Linear B, which was from a bit of a later period and on the mainland Greece and Basically, all the written records using Linear B were like ledgers of what type of grain and how much of it was in storerooms, so wasn't that exciting? And that's probably what Linear A is. But what if it's not? What if it's the secret of life? Again, Liv, this is a mythology podcast. Calm down. The Minoans, the term Minoans came from this ancient king, King Minos, and he was mythologically the son of Zeus and Europa. Zeus and Europa had three sons, and Minos was kind of in competition with his two brothers on who would be the king of Crete. I guess Minos did officially ascend the throne, but his brothers were basically like, hell no, and they tried to take it from him. You know how brothers can be always stealing kingships. Minos decides that in order to defeat his brothers, or I guess just sort of, he is already king, so we basically just get rid of his brothers? I don't know. He's against them in some way. And he asks Poseidon for help in defeating his brothers in whatever way he needs to. Mm -hmm. Poseidon is, of course, the god of the sea. He's also the god of horses, but don't ask me why. Anyway, Minos asks Poseidon for help. He prays to Poseidon, asking him to send a snow-white bull as a show of support. That's right, another bull. A white bull is, of course, how his father seduced his mother, which I think makes this a hint creepier. So Minos asks for this bull, and Poseidon is a nice guy, and he sends it to him, along with a show of support for the king. Or I guess this bull kind of is the show of support. So now there's this fancy white bull hanging around Knossos. Minos is then expected to kill the bull to show that he's honoring Poseidon for this super pointless and pretty creepy gift. Needless animal death if I've ever seen one. But spoilies, Minos doesn't kill the bull. He thinks it's just too damn pretty. He's a sucker for a beautiful bull. I think it runs in the family. Poseidon is not psyched by this pretty obvious betrayal and he's basically like, well fuck you then Minos, I'm gonna totally fuck up your life now. And he does a little godly magic, and he makes Minos' wife, Pasiphae, fall truly, madly, deeply in love with this bull. And godly magic is potent as fuck, my friends, because boy does she fall in love. Meanwhile, in the lives of people not in love with bulls, Minos also has his own personal inventor. This is a fellow by the name of Daedalus, and he lives on the island of Crete with his son Icarus. Daedalus is awesome. He's basically the king of fucking crazy incredible inventions. So Daedalus, this resident inventor, is called to see Pasiphae. 
See, she's been hanging out with her new love lately, this white bull, and she's been feeling kind of frustrated. See, as much as she is truly madly deeply in love with this rando animal, the animal just doesn't seem to be into her. Unrequited love. She's pretty worked up about it. You know, she's feeling forlorn, melancholy. She's walking around the palace just huffing in sadness and, frankly, in sexual frustration. Finally, she turns to Daedalus. He's called in to see her, and she asks him for a simple, totally normal, and not at all creepy invention. She wants him to make her a wooden cow. Yes, a hollow wooden cow. Do you see where I'm going with this? Because I will tell you where I'm going with this. Pasiphae wants Daedalus to make her a hollow wooden cow that she can hide in. Mm Mm-hmm. And boy, does Daedalus deliver. He creates a cow that is realistic enough to convince the bull that it is, indeed, a real cow. The bull is suddenly super interested because, you know, he's into other cows, unlike someone. Or I guess, too much like someone. Granted, this is Poseidon's fault, yes. But I do think we need to give Pacifique credit where credit is due. This is a creepy, creative way of solving a human versus bull problem, and it is all her own. The love, the forced love, that's not good. But man, is she showing some major ingenuity. You can't let a man take credit for everything, right? Anyway, so Pasiphae hides inside this wooden cow. She's, you know, strategically placed. And anyway, long story short, she definitely has sex with that bull while in the wooden cow. And she definitely gets impregnated because, you know, mythology. Now, as much as I want to give Pasiphae credit where credit is due, let's also take a beat here and talk about how fucked this is. Men in ancient Greek mythology were allowed to fuck whoever, whatever they wanted, anytime, any place. They transformed into animals sometimes, sure, but it was always the physical form and not some weird contraption. But female sexuality and a woman with certain human desires was so troubling to the ancient Greeks that they came up with a story about her using a crazy deceptive contraption just to get away with bestiality. She's not allowed to have sexual desires even when they're forced upon her by god magic. What have I said about how awesome it would be to be female back then? So often I think, god, what I wouldn't give to experience life where mythology is real and it's what you live your life on and then I think oh but I'd be a woman and it would suck a lot. I'm pretty sure Aphrodite is the only woman who can do whatever she wants sexually and all the power to her but she was the goddess of sexual desire so it doesn't say much about the other regular ladies out there that also you know had human needs. Anyway, all to say, it's fucked, and Pasiphae is impregnated, and she eventually gives birth to the famous Minotaur. This is a creature that was the result of a human woman having sex with a bull. And the Minoan culture of Crete was built around the idolatry of bulls. They worshipped them more so than any other animal, which is, I guess, not saying a lot, but it was bull-centric. And whenever this mythical interpretation of their thing for bulls came into the common understanding of Crete, like, that's hard to say, you know, when it became like, oh, yeah, well, this woman had sex with a bull. But either way, the history, for the history of Greece, like, this was a thing. The minotaur was around and bulls were something special in some way. Anyway, it's weird and crazy and super cool and I love it. As with basically all Greek mythology. So just to reiterate, as much as this troubling concept was created by men to show how very problematic it was when women had sexual desires, I'm going to go ahead and just reclaim the whole idea for Pasiphae by saying again, animal or not, this is the most creative seduction ever. So well done, Pasiphae. You got yours. Applause goes to you, my good woman. Now, the minotaur she gave birth to is a creature who is half man and half bull, In most of the iterations, he has the top half of a bull with horns and weird arms with hooves, but also like crazy human abs. 
And then the bottom half is a human, you know, just walking along on humans, normal standard human legs. He's really a sight to behold. It's super weird. Who came up with that? Honest, this is what I love. Something about the top half bull. Because, you know, we got centaurs and you got satyrs and everything. But those are all top half human. And there's something about that that's just so much more normal. Anyway, top half bull really is has me reeling. Originally, Minotaur was a proper noun, but it was co-opted, much like Pegasus, into a common noun also, which just refers to basically anything Minotaur-like. But in Greek mythology, there was only this one. There wasn't a whole collection of ladies finding ways to seduce bulls, which is, I guess, good for feminism? Pasiphae, you know, nurses the Minotaur, treats him like her own, which, ouch, but as he grows older, he becomes more and more like, oh, I don't know, a bull unexpected I know so he's growing up and he's becoming crazy ferocious but I mean can you blame him he mustn't have been the most popular kid in school bullying does real damage you know and of course Pasiphae and Minos also went on to have their own standard human children so on top of bullying and being a super freak poor Minotaur also has sibling rivalry to deal with by way of her human husband, Minos, Pasiphae gives birth to two daughters, Ariadne and Phaedra. She had other kids too, but for the purposes of this story and the story that will follow, Ariadne and Phaedra are the most important. They also have the best names ever. And who cares about their brothers? Not me. So the Minotaur is getting a bit cray and Minos and Pasiphae have to figure out what to do with him. Much like how Pasiphae got busy with a bull, they called upon their old friend and badass inventor, Daedalus. They asked Daedalus to create something that would safely house the Minotaur, who, I guess as a little P.S., had discovered that he could basically only eat people. You know, minor detail. So they need something created where the Minotaur can live, but also with some means of him getting fed as well. None of his family members want to go near him, I wonder why. So this thing had to be kind of self-sufficient in a way. Daedalus, you know, genius behind the bull seduction vehicle, comes up with an idea. He builds a labyrinth where the Minotaur will live. Now this is probably the most famous labyrinth of all time, at least that doesn't have David Bowie in the center. R.I.P. Daedalus builds the labyrinth because the thinking is that the Minotaur will be able to live in the middle and then everyone in Crete can release prisoners or whoever into the labyrinth as food for the Minotaur. The prisoners nor the Minotaur would be able to leave because Daedalus has come up with some crazy intricate design that is, I guess, whatever the opposite of impregnable is. Is it just pregnable? Maybe that makes logical sense. All to say, you can't get out. Apparently, it was even so intricate that Daedalus himself had trouble getting out after it was built. This was, I assume, but for it had a super scary minotaur in the middle. And there you go. The labyrinth is built. They've placed Mr. Minotaur safely in the center where he can't get out and eat people. He can only eat the people that King Minos forces into the labyrinth themselves. So totally fine and not at all morally problematic. But... The labyrinth is so vital to the safety of Knossos that now that Daedalus knows its secrets, having, you know, built it, King Minos decides he can't have Daedalus leaving Crete and revealing the secrets of the labyrinth to the rest of the world. The rest of the world being, you know, where Minos is getting his human sacrifices, so it's a pretty touchy subject. Daedalus and by extension his son Icarus are now prisoners on the island of Crete. And like I said, Crete is really, really far from mainland Greece, so it's not as if they can easily escape. Minos is keeping a strict eye on all the boats that are leaving. Every one of them is being searched, TSA style. But Daedalus, being the badass inventor that he is, decides he'll outsmart Minos, which probably isn't hard, you know. He starts to construct wings that he and his son will wear to fly from Crete back to Athens. He collects all the feathers that he can, which isn't as hard as it could have been, given Crete is an island and Knossos is right on the coast, many a seagull losing their feathers, thank goodness. He builds the wings, tying together from smallest to largest the best feathers to mimic the functionality of 
a real bird's wings. He secures everything with wax and string, and he shapes these massive wings in to perfectly match a bird's. When one set is made, he tries them out. He secures the wings on his arms, and he begins to flap. He rises slowly in the air, and eventually he's buoyed up, floating weightlessly. Now he knows the work, so he makes the same style of wings for his son, and they're ready to take off. One quick warning, he says to Icarus, just don't fly too high, okay? Because these things are made from wax and string, and that sun is awfully hot. And, you know, don't actually fly too low either, because if you get them wet, you're almost equally fucked. So just, you know, don't be a dummy, okay? Both sets of wings work, and the two men fly high into the sky over the Mediterranean. It must have been a ridiculously beautiful view. That bright blue sea, the islands, and the boats beneath you. I'm pretty jealous, to be honest. I'm less jealous of what happens to dummy Icarus next, though. Now, I'm sure many of you know what's coming, because this is one of the most famous tales of youth stupidity. Icarus, forgetting the very sound warning his father gave him not 20 minutes ago, flies too close to the sun. And just as Daedalus predicted, Icarus's wings begin to melt in the hot sun, and it's only moments before Icarus plunges into the sea below and drowns. And, well, frankly, that's it. So this episode ends on kind of a bummer, what can I say? But our story with the old Minotaur and the Labyrinth isn't over, my friends. Nope, next week I'll cover Prince Theseus of Athens and his adventures before and after his very famous run-in with the Labyrinth and the Minotaur roaming around it. I'll also just say for any, I don't even know what to call us out there, but there are two really good songs by the band Thrice about Daedalus and Icarus, which I just think is really cool and weird because they're pretty loud band, I guess, and they sing a lot about this particular Greek myth. There's one called The Melting Point of Wax, which I think makes a lot of sense what it's about, and one just called Daedalus, and they're both great. Recommend you listen. Thank you so much for listening again, everyone. Truly, it's uh, wonderful to see that people are listening. It's really exciting. So again, like I mentioned at the beginning, please feel free to reach out and be in touch. If you have suggestions of a myth you want to hear in the future, please let me know. I'm open to anything. Uh, you can reach me. Instagram is at MythsBaby. Twitter is at MythsBaby. Facebook is, guess what, at MythsBaby. There is not much on the Facebook yet, but there will be, and right now it at least exists. I also have a website where there is also not much on it, but I'm really prepping, you guys, mostly because I just wanted to make sure I had my name. So, guess what the website is? It's at Myths... It's not at. It's just MythsBaby.com because it's a website and it's not a handle. If you would rate and review this podcast on iTunes, also available on Google Play and Stitcher and SoundCloud and probably a million other places because it's the internet, guys, and things just spread. Please check me out. Listen, learn, subscribe, tell your friends, share this weird and totally magical world that is Greek mythology and the people who are crazy about it. Guys, it's been a good week. Next week, Theseus, the biggest asshole in Greek mythology. That's right, you thought Zeus was the biggest asshole? You were wrong. My name is Liv, and I love this shit. <laughs>